you can leave the house, but never sleep anywhere else. As I drove down the highway, theories buzzed in my head like a swarm of locusts. Did Paul kill Zach in a drunk driving accident? Did Paul wire up the shattered coat rack, crawl through the tunnel, and set it back in my house? Was Paul a servant of the intruder? Was I becoming a servant of the intruder? After my clusterfuck of a vision, at least a few things made more sense. Not only was the intruder connected to its victims, the intruder's victims were connected to each other. Maybe it was some kind of hive mind. Maybe it was turning people into intruders themselves. At this point, it seemed like anything was possible. And the way Paul's eyes moved outside the diner all those years ago, like somebody had jumped into his head, taken a quick look around, then jumped back out again. Now I knew that it was me. I'm the one who jumped into Paul's head. The nightmare logic of everything made me nauseous. Like a carnival ride with no exits. A paradox web of chaos and madness, with answers always hiding one step out of reach. Above all was another question. Exactly who was the supposed old friend in Paul's house? The person he owed a favour. The person he was taking care of. Was it my childhood friend? Zack? During my sporadic visions, I saw a green bike through Paul's eyes. The exact same bike my friend Zack was riding when he supposedly died. Did Paul hit him all those years ago? Did he find Zack barely alive on the side of the road and bring him back home? Was he keeping him alive to this day? with his medical equipment and military training. Did the timelines even match up? It was possible, sure, but crazy even to consider. What are the chances? Paul happening to live across the street from me all these years later. Was the intruder orchestrating everything from the start? Perhaps this entity had been involved in my life far longer than the last few weeks. Now that I thought about it, there was a vague familiarity about everything, almost like deja vu. Like that feeling one gets around death. You'll know it if you've ever survived a bad car accident or faced something potentially terminal. You see part of the abyss. You finally realise, maybe for the first time, that at some point, You won't exist anymore. You barely existed to begin with. In the words of Max Schumacher from Network, death becomes a perceptible thing with definable features. Before all this, I never really feared death. There were times I welcomed it. That's easy to say when it's sitting off in the distance caged behind bars. But when the end of everything is standing just ten feet away, looking you in the eyes. My phone started buzzing in a cup holder, slowly spinning around as the screen lit up. I pulled into the parking lot of a nearby gas station, Buster's Better Gas. Parked the car, Grabbed my phone and called the missed number back. Bradley? Said the voice on the other end. Ah, Brandon. Oh, Brandon. It was Howie, of course. Yeah, what's up? I said. Uh, Not much, just uh, checking to see if you're okay. I haven't seen you in a while. 
Yeah, I'm fine. Just been running some errands. Oh, you weren't here last night? Uh, no. Huh. What? Well, somebody tore down your, uh, art thing. Art thing? I'd already forgotten about my excuse for the barricaded door. The, uh, basement door. He said. Whole thing's gone. Frame two. Oh. I said, trying to sound calm. Yeah, I, um, I paid some guys to take it out. I lied. In the middle of the night? Yeah, I guess so, if that's when they showed up. I went to bed and the door was there. And I woke up and the door was gone. I guess they were quiet, I said, the lie growing more absurd by the second. Yeah, I'm a light sleeper too, he chuckled. Anyways, Howie continued. I'm just calling to ask if it's cool I crash a few more weeks. I'll pay you rent once I get the money. Yeah, Howie, don't worry about it, I said. Is that it? Yeah, see you, Brandon. Thanks, thanks again. It really means a lot. I hung up. Fantastic. Now the basement door was gone. In all the confusion, I still hadn't realised my violation of Rule 8. You can leave the house, but never sleep anywhere else. My thoughts drifted back to Mitch. He knew a lot more than he was letting on. I still didn't trust him, but I trusted him more than Paul. Low bar, I know. I pulled out my phone and dialed his number. Five tones rang out, straight to voicemail. Mailbox full. I called again, same thing. I called again, three tones rang out, then silence. He cut the call short. Mitch was ignoring me. I tucked my phone away and stepped out into the parking lot. Inside the gas station, I bought a cheap burner phone and a pack of smokes. Eh, Sure, I quit a few months back, but I needed something to calm my nerves. Besides, I'd quit again after this pack. Stop judging me. Back in my car, I lit up a dart and called Mitch on the burner phone. He wouldn't recognise the number this way. I hated being stalkerish, but my life literally depended on it. Three tones rang out and... Mitch answered. Hello? Mitch, please don't hang up. Silence. And then... What do you want? I'm sorry I spoke with you. I stopped myself from saying Dad. With the neighbour. I just... What do you want? Said Mitch, losing patience. I just need to talk. One more time, in person. I don't know. He sighed. I've already said too much. Just keep following the rules. Ignore everything else. Mitch, please. I'm losing my mind here. Just one more talk. What did you tell the neighbour? Barely anything. I just said- You know what? Never mind. (sighs) Number three- Baker Street. Ring me when you get here. He ended the call. Mitch lived about 40 minutes away, in a small town off the interstate. In one of those towns where Main Street's nothing but a graveyard of pre-Walmart family shops. Survival of the cheapest. I pulled up to an old grey concrete apartment building that looked straight out of Soviet Russia. This was the place. 
lugging my crutches out of the back seat. I climbed out of the car and shut the door. Thanks to crashing into the roadside barrier, a heavy indent was scraped into the side of my car. Great. I double checked my pockets. Phone. Check. Switchblade. Check. I brought my chrome switchblade everywhere now, just in case. It was already dark out. The days were getting shorter. The air was cold. And my breath was foggy. I crutched up to the building and rung in Mitch's room number. Rubbing my freezing hands together, I waited. The door buzzed open. Mitch's place looked early 70s to me. Open design, cut down the middle. Half kitchen, half living room. Between them, a bar with rickety stools. Mitch looked a little better than the last time I saw him. Still tired, though. Hey, Mitch, I said, forcing a smile. Silent, Mitch stood about six feet away. He smiled, strode back into the kitchen, and started scrubbing dishes in the sink. I took off my coat and pulled the door shut behind me. Mitch scraped grime off a cast iron frying pan. His back turned to me. I walked up to the edge of his kitchen and looked around. His place was tidy, like a hotel room. What did the neighbour tell you? Said Mitch, referring to his father. A lot. You believe him? I don't know. Mitch sighed, tossed the dishes down, and turned off the sink. Shaking water off his hands, he turned around and leaned back against the countertop. So what do you want from me? He said, wiping his hands onto his shirt. I have some questions, I said. Well, some was an understatement. Okay, shoot. Um, I didn't know where to start. Last night, I almost ran into a bear, swerved, hit my head on the window, almost blacked out and then you snapped into other people's minds? Saw things from the past, maybe even the future? Said Mitch, crossing his arms. I looked at him, surprised. Yeah, I mean more than that, but... Mitch shook his head as if to say, I expected as much. What does it mean? I said. Look, what you're doing right now, you being here, this whole rabbit hole of finding the truth, it's not healthy. The more obsessed you get, the more crazy you become, the crazier you are the easier it is to control you. Control me? Mitch ignored the question. Stop expecting some priest or medium to come in and explain what's going on. Nobody's going to show up and tell you how this thing spawned from an ancient curse or some other bullshit, and the only way to kill it is to sacrifice a dog or pray to Jesus, he said mockingly. That's not what this is. You can't reason with something that doesn't think. The only thing you can do is keep following the rules and put off more time between now and then. He trailed into morbid silence. If you think this is gonna end all tied up with a neat little bow, you're gonna end up severely fucking traumatized. As if I wasn't already. Mitch looked up at the ceiling, considering his next words carefully. There's a good reason I've been so vague about everything. The more involved you are, the more you know, the more you share, the more you search for answers. The more it slithers into your life, 
into your thoughts, your dreams, everything. Mitch rubbed his jaw. I barely escaped it myself, he said, looking across the room, staring at the door behind me. I glanced back over my shoulder. There was a floor-length mirror on the door, partially obscured by my coat. After it took my dad, Mitch continued, I almost got pulled in. I started researching, investigating, and that's when the vision started. Like what happened to you in the car. The intruder feeds you these little snippets of random moments. All of them, they feel like they might be connected. Like they should have a reason. And maybe they do, but just because something has a reason, that doesn't mean it's a good one. What's going to happen to me, Mitch? I said. It's already happening. You're becoming a servant of the... Tulpa. Or whatever it is. The worst part is you'll still feel in control. But you won't be. Soon enough, you'll start breaking into people's houses at night. Leaving coat racks in the basements. Just like my dad. Maybe you've already done it and you forgot. Then you'll be telling people to not worry about it. Telling them to work on themselves. Telling them there's no such thing as ghosts. How do you know all this? I don't know. It's all theory. At the end of the day, who the fuck knows anything about anything? Who knows what the Tulpa wants? Maybe it feeds off the chaos. Maybe it's working towards something bigger. I don't know. I don't want to. How did Paul really die? Mitch grit his teeth. And he just stared at me. Shaking his head. His eyes filled with a look of, Fuck it, you really want to know? When I was a kid, he said, after mum took us and moved out, a few years went by and... Dad started getting his life together. Stopped drinking, stopped leaving creepy notes in people's shoes. Got on some good meds, etc. So mum, after some gentle pushing from my sister, calls him up and asks him out for coffee. Mitch went silent, eyes flicking back and forth across the wall behind me. That same night after the phone call, Dad gets shit-faced, drives up to the Bowery Cliffs. Same lookout he and Mum used to go stargazing at. Mitch grimaced. So he drives at full speed toward the cliff edge and slams Bumper first into the barrier post. He shook his head. Believe it or not, he wasn't the first person to drive a car off the Bowery Cliffs. City put up the post a few months prior. Mitch pressed his tongue into the side of his cheek, thinking. So anyways, Dad's still drunk as hell, passed out facing the airbag. Mitch pushed off from the counter, stepped over to the table, pulled out a chair and sat down. Gas leak catches fire. Dad burns alive. Mitch tapped his knuckles against the table a few times. Police said he was out cold, didn't feel a thing, but I knew enough to know that wasn't true. Saw a photo of the corpse by accident, mouth wide open. Mitch opened his mouth to show. I'm no expert, but people don't generally scream when they're asleep. Mitch slapped the table and ran his hand back and forth a couple of times. So we make arrangements to sell Dad's house. It's the weekend, we're moving stuff out, and then... He paused, looked directly at me. There comes Dad, riding a brand new motorcycle. He's all confused too, what are we doing with his stuff, you know? Mitch breathed out his nose. Said he was on a trip out of the country. Of course, Mum loses her mind. 
how we all lose our minds. Dad's back from the fucking grave and all. Mitch looked away, his eyes watering slightly now. He stamped his foot against the laminate flooring. The coroner's report, the police. It's like none of it even happened. Mum was hysterical, screaming at the police station saying they were trying to gaslight us. They weren't. Documents never existed. At least not anymore. The state almost took us away from her for insanity. So she stopped talking about it. We all did. Telling people you believe in ghosts lands you in an awkward conversation. Telling people your dad is back from the dead lands you in a psych ward. He scoffed. The thing that really fucked with me, aside from the obvious, was his hands. Mitch held up his hands and spread his fingers. Ten fingers including the one he shot off in the basement. Mitch looked at me again. This thing bent reality over us like a fucking wire. Like it bumped us into a parallel world or something. Mitch looked away again, staring at the kitchen cupboards as he spoke. Dad, or whatever replaced him, kept trying to reconnect with us. We wouldn't have it. Moved cross-country, Cut off all ties. Mitch sighed. Things got a little better after that. Distance helped. Especially back then. He trailed off into silence. What made you come back? I don't know. Guilt, maybe? Morbid curiosity? And why the notes? I started asking around his neighbourhood, low profile, if people had seen anything, heard anything, you know, off, about my dad. Everyone there was so fucking weird and similar. Weird ticks, like... Mitch rubbed his forehead with the back of his thumb to show. People unable to remember basic words their eyes lighting up randomly and looking around as if someone else was in there. Same stuff I noticed with my dad. Like the thing from his basement was spreading, taking over the whole neighbourhood, like a virus, he said, shifting his weight slightly. How did you figure out the rules? I didn't. I mean, not fully. Those were just things that seemed to slow it down, at least in my dad's case. Before we left him, I found it all scribbled up on a napkin. Dad, for all his flaws, he's really fucking smart, logical. He would have tested things out, experimented, figured out exactly what the entity reacts to, doesn't react to, etc. So... All this to say, the more you know, the more he controls you. Maybe. It's only a theory. And I'm basically fucked, no matter what I do. Mitch stepped up from the table, strode over to the kitchen sink and stared out of the brick wall view. He sighed. Look, Brandon... I should have been more honest with you before. But you want to know the truth, right? Yes. This has been over and done with from the start. I didn't respond. Ever since you snapped the coat rack in half, he continued, it was game over. I blinked. He looked back at me over his shoulder. I didn't tell you that because I didn't want you to panic. The more calm you are, the more sane you are, the longer it takes for this thing to get a hold of you. Get a hold of me? You're becoming a part of it now. Just like my dad. Just like the neighbours. And there's nothing I can do to stop it? Mitch shook his head and looked back out the window. 
you should leave, he said. Posture slumped as he set his hands onto the countertop. But I still don't leave now, he snapped, his voice booming with surprising loudness. I shook my head, crouched back for the door, pulled on my coat and wrapped my hand around the doorknob. Thanks for the help, I said, voice dripping with sarcasm. I turned the knob. It was locked. Weird. I unlocked it and tried again. Still locked. Ah, Mitch, I said, looking at him in the mirror of the door. Mitch, back turned, now with pin straight posture, stood in the center of the kitchen now, hands covering his face like somebody playing peekaboo. Mitch, I said, looking back over my shoulder. Suddenly, the room shifted darker, but the lights didn't go out. Like a camera shifting aperture, everything dimmed into a slow motion nightmare. Mitch's left hand shot straight up into the air, as if being pulled from above. Then his right hand, both hands straight up in the air, standing on his tiptoes like a cursed ballerina. I watched in wide-eyed horror, paralysed. Suddenly, his arms dropped to his sides, like an invisible straitjacket was wrapped around him. He stood there, motionless. Then he burst into coughing, hunched over and staggered towards the sink, rubbing his forehead as he went. Thank God his body language was normal again. You okay? I said, taking a few careful steps forward. He threw a hand up, motioning me to stay back. I did, but his desperate wheezing and coughs only grew worse, like he was choking. He thumped his chest, until finally, something flew out of his mouth and plopped into the dirty sink water. I'm okay, he said gasping for breath. I'm okay. I glanced back towards the door. Mitch, back still turned to me, plunged his hand into the soapy water, fishing around for whatever had come out of his throat. He froze, and his eyebrows raised. Slowly, he lifted something out of the water, an object about the size of a chapstick, but I couldn't tell what it was from this distance. What the fuck? Mitch whispered. His hand suddenly swung to his sides again. The object flew to the floor, slid across the kitchen, and slowed to a stop right in front of me. It was a dismembered finger. What the fuck was right? Mitch staggered back from the sink. Seven quick steps. He straightened up into pin-straight posture again. Tried to speak, but only gargled whimpers escaped, like he was being suffocated. I stepped backwards towards the door, eyes darting around the room for another escape. There was no balcony, but I was too many floors up for that anyway. What the fuck? Mitch screamed. What the f- His voice cut off into a choking mess. Suddenly, his throat swelled up, like something was pushing on it from the inside out. His head snapped back, forcing him to look straight up at the ceiling. And then, something pushed out from his mouth. Several somethings, long and wriggling, like worms. Fingers. Long fingers slid out from his mouth and wrapped around his face like leeches. Gaunt hands, unnaturally large, squeezed together as they wriggled their way out of his mouth. Pig-coloured skin, like a face hugger. 
the same hands I saw wrapped around the coat rack all those nights ago. Pulling his mouth wider and wider until it started ripping at the corners of the lips. Enough was enough. I spun around and shouldered into the door, using all my weight to crash into it again and again and again. All the while witnessing the horrific sight behind me in the reflection of the door mirror. Hidden by shadows, something tall and fetus-like was climbing out of Mitch's body. Naked and dripping with guts, pushing what was left of Mitch's skin down like somebody climbing out of an undersized wetsuit. Finally, the door broke open. I stumbled into the hallway and slammed into the opposite wall one of my crutches falling back into Mitch's apartment. Goodbye, crutch. I single crutch the fuck out of there. But the hallway was different now, stretching on for eternity in both directions, growing darker and darker. I didn't have time to think about it. I just kept pushing forward, hobbling down the increasingly narrow passage. Behind me, the sound of staggering footsteps getting closer all the while. That's when I realised the hallway's increased length was partially illusion, a forced perceptive miniature gradually getting smaller and smaller as it went. I kept pushing forward, the ever lower ceiling scraping against my head, forcing me into crouching, forcing me onto hands and knees. Crawling through this miniature apartment hallway as the walls and whatever was chasing me, inched closer. The smell of burned hair and gasoline growing stronger all the while. Darkness. The air changed. From dry, air-conditioned cool, to humid and dark. I didn't care. I just kept crawling, shuffling forward bit by bit, my back scraping against the dirt ceiling as I went. Light suddenly appeared. Less than 20 feet away. A room. Exhausted, I crawled faster. The sound of my own breath bouncing off the walls around me. Finally, I broke into the room. Spun around and looked back into the tunnel empty. As far as I could see, whatever had been chasing me was gone. For now. Crutchless now, I pulled myself to a nearby wall, slumped against it, and caught my breath, eyes locked on the dark tunnel all the while, just in case. After a few minutes of catching my breath and calming myself down, I looked around. Dirt floors. Plywood walls. This impossibly shifting tunnel had led me into the back corner of a basement. Not just any basement. Paul's basement. Basement.